right, ready to get into the message? Build this house. Build this house. Um, my wife and I, although we're very different people, uh, there's some things that we, we have in common. One of the things uh, that we both have in common is that we're house people. How many people are house people? How many people are confused by that question? You're like, I don't know what that means. I live in a house. So uh, what I mean by that is uh, there's some people that are clothes people. Some people are food people. Some people are car people. We're house people. And that does not mean that we have a lot of money and a lot of homes uh, at all. What it just means is we appreciate homes. I appreciate what goes into building a house. Uh, I appreciate the diversity of homes. Like some neighborhoods, you know, are like the cookie cutter kind of thing. But I like, I, I like the neighborhoods where you just, every house looks different, right? There was like, there was a plan, like there was creative stuff going on and when it was all put together. And so if ever we're driving around the city or other cities, we're just kind of constantly looking at homes and commenting on homes. It's just something we appreciate. Well, I say all of that to say this, like in the same way that our physical homes can look and feel different from one another, uh, so can the house of God, the church, look and feel different from one another. Now, we all have like the same foundation, right? We all, we all kind of believe the same core things, but, but like, I just got to tell you, like in this city, like I have the privilege of just knowing and walking with so many different pastors and, and, and great pastors and, and great churches, great unique spiritual houses in this city. And, and they're all a little bit unique. And then you come here to Parkwood and there's just something a little bit different here. And there's nothing wrong with any of that. Like God is calling all of us to just be a unique expression of his house in this city for the glory of his name. Amen? Amen. The question now becomes, well, if that's true, then what type of house does God want Parkwood to be? That's what we're exploring in this series. So last week, we started with kind of the big idea, focusing in on that, that God wanted us to be a house of hope. That, that like, if we're known for anything, like, may we be known for just, like, hope in Jesus Christ, <laughs> right? We literally have this saying all around our church, find hope, find home. Uh, hope is a big thing. Uh, hope is not optimism. Hope is not positive thinking. Hope is a strong, uh, like, rooted trust that Jesus actually is who he said he was, and he's going to do what he said he's going to do. And the reason why we have hope that Jesus is that guy who can actually do it, and what he said is because he came back from the dead. Like, that was all last week. We just looked at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it's so compelling and so amazing that it gives us all the hope that we need. Now, that was last week. If you missed it, you can go online, YouTube, a whole bunch of things, our website, and you can pick that up. Today, as we're moving on, we're moving on from a house of hope, and today what I want to talk to us about is how God wants us to be a house of love. Just turn to your neighbor and say, house of love. House of love. Hopefully that person is your spouse. <laughs> or things just got really weird in here. I'm trying to help you people. If you're looking for someone, just matchmaking right here. House of love. <laughs> House of love. Oh, you got a Bible. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to spend all of our time today in the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, if you don't know, this book of the Bible, 1 Corinthians, it was originally a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul to a church in the ancient city of Corinth. Now, what you need to know about Corinth was, as an ancient city, like in the first century, it was a mega city. Uh, it was a very diverse city, uh, but it was big. Like, it was really, really big, but it wasn't just big. It was, it was kind of bad. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm giving the, the, the PG version here. Uh, but this city was notorious, actually, amongst all the other cities for what was going on in it. You had the temple to the goddess Aphrodite up on a hill, temple prostitutes coming down every night. Uh, shady stuff. Uh, really, really shady stuff. Uh, so big city, uh, bad city. In fact, what was going on inside of this city was, was so wild 
that in the vastness of the Roman Empire, that no matter where you lived, if you were a person who just lived in like utter moral depravity without any rules at all, no matter where you lived in the Roman Empire, you were called a Corinthianizer. Like, you got to think about how bad of a reputation this city has in order to like, that, 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 that caught on like all over the Roman Empire. It was a wild city, diverse city, big city, bad city. That's Corinth. Now, what's really sad is not just that this city had that reputation, but that the church inside of this city wasn't much different. The church in Corinth, hands down, was the worst church in the New Testament. Like, hands down. The sternest warnings in the entire New Testament go to this church, and there's a few different reasons why. Uh, Number one, their their theology was off. And so there's a lot of writings in 1 and 2 Corinthians, these books, where Paul is Uh, trying to help them get back on track because their thinking was wrong. Their ideas of God was wrong. Uh, But then on top of that, it wasn't just their theology, their morality was off. Uh, There's there's even a situation that Paul has to address in 1 Corinthians where there was like a family that was having, like there was like sexual incest happening in this family that was well known about in the church and no one was just like, like, okay, well, let's, let's just let them be them, and we're going to be us. And Paul's like, no, this is weird. Stop it. You know, like, their theology was off, their morality was off. And, but one of the big things that you're going to find with the church in Corinth uh, was that they, they were experiencing deep divisions. I said this in the nine, but it's important that we understand there's a big difference between a disagreement and a division. Inside of the church of Jesus Christ, we can disagree on many different items. At least more like the open hand items. Closed hand items, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. He's coming back again. We, we don't disagree on that. That's what it means to be a Christian. But there's, there's other things that, that, that we, we, we can see different points of view on. That's okay, and there, there's a healthy way to do that. Um, that's a disagreement. Division is when you let those secondary items become so big in your life that it literally separates the church. And division is like the most dangerous thing to a church. It's like, it's like our kryptonite, okay? It's, it is the thing that will kill us the fastest. Division brings death to the church. And so what, what's happening here in this church, it wasn't just a church who had messed up theology and messed up morality and it's also a church experiencing real deep divisions. So I just thought today, as we're going to talk about being a house of love, (laughs) that we would start by learning some lessons from a loveless church, a divided church. So today, all of our time is in 1 Corinthians, and we're going to go to three different passages of Scripture. I'm going to show you two horrible things, and then we're going to move into the third, which is going to it's going to give us some, some hope, and we can kind of see a path forward. You with me? Yes. Okay. Let's go. 1 Corinthians 3. Here's our first text this morning, verse 1 to 7. Paul says this to the loveless church. He says, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there's jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned each to his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. All right, so here's our first text that we'll kind of dive into for a moment. The the first thing that Paul uh, calls out in this church here um, is basically the fact it's their childlike behavior. And I was trying to figure out a way of how to like illustrate this. So I came up with this. I walked down in our gym storage and I found a little kiddie pool. 
Um, I think it'll illustrate the point. Okay, uh, imagine with me that we were all going to the beach, okay? Uh, in a nice beach, okay? We're not in Windsor, Essex County anymore. <laughs> we are in like Florida or the Bahamas. We're, you know where like the water, like you can like see through an inch of it, like deeper, like that nice water, we're there, okay? Wherever that is for you. And all these people are out in the water, they're having fun, and then you find me, and I'm not in the ocean. I'm not in the lake, whatever you're picturing. No, rather, I'm, I'm hanging out in a kiddie pool by myself. My kids aren't with me. My kids are at home, by the way. And I'm just, you know, splashing, enjoying the kiddie pool, life in the kiddie pool, right? This is weird, isn't it? Can we just acknowledge that what's happening right now is weird? And can I tell you why this is weird? I'm just going to point out a very obvious thing to you. I don't fit in the kiddie pool, but that's not it. Why this is weird is because adults don't belong in kiddie pools. You understand? Adults belong in the deep end of the pool. Adults belong in the ocean swimming. Adults don't belong in this. This is weird. This is an adult acting like a child. Okay? So get that picture in your head and now think about Paul in this church. He said, he said like, this is, this is you, church in Corinth. You're spiritually speaking, you're like you're, you're adults, but you're acting like kids. And he says, right? He says, like, I, I want to talk to you like adults, but I can't. Because you keep acting like kids. And as long as you keep acting like kids, I'm going to keep treating you like kids. So it begs the question, okay, well, what were they doing that was childlike? What were they doing that was keeping them in the kiddie pool? Well, it says right in here, they were dividing on many different things. You should read First and Second Corinthians. It's a wild ride. But like one of the things, interestingly, that they were, they were dividing over, they were dividing over who their favorite preachers were. Isn't that interesting? And I don't mean having like disagreements. Like we all have our preference, right? And like, well, I like this guy and I like this. That's not what's happening here, okay? What's happening here is literally hurtful divisions were taking place inside of the church around teachers. I follow Paul. No, I follow Apollos. And Paul writes the letter. He's like, are you kidding me right now? Like, seriously. He says, who am I? Who's Apollos? Nothing. We water, we plant seeds. Only Christ can bring the growth. He's saying, church in Corinth, you got to grow up, get out of the kiddie pool, and get your eyes on Jesus, because only Jesus can build his house. Only Jesus can make things grow. But this issue, (laughs) this issue of adults acting like children around their speakers was not just a first century issue. Like, you better believe this still plays itself out all the time. We get in arms folded, judgmental glares. Well, I don't like this speaker because, well, well, he doesn't talk about the Holy Spirit enough. Well, I don't like this speaker because he talks about the Holy Spirit too much. Makes me feel kind of weird. I don't like this speaker because he doesn't yell at the government enough. I don't like this speaker because he yells at the government too much. Am I getting close to anyone's home right now? (laughs) Well, I don't like this guy because his vision's too weak. Well, I don't like this guy because he demands too much of me. Like, on and on we go, separating, dividing, saying very hurtful things. Now, please hear me this morning. I'm not saying that there isn't a time to disagree. I'm not saying that there isn't a time to confront issues in the church. Yes and amen. Iron sharpens iron. I get that. But there is a way to go about that that unites the church, and there is a way that goes about it that divides it. And like I said, nothing brings death to the church faster than division. 
Or maybe the words of Jesus can fall heavy this morning when he said that a church divided against itself, a house divided against itself, cannot stand. It will collapse. That's what Jesus says. Division is a massive threat to the church, and this church was divided. Now, that's only one example that I just gave you. They're divided over their teachers. They're, they're missing Jesus, and they're getting caught in the weeds down here in some really weird way. Now, let's look at another text. If you're in uh, chapter 3, just thumb over a few pages. Uh, let's go to chapter 11. Uh, here, uh, the language is going to intensify. I like to think as Paul wrote this letter, he's just getting more annoyed as it goes on. But he's addressing very real issues. Uh, listen to this. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, we'll start in verse 17. Same letter to the same church. Just keep that in mind. He says this, In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. Like, for real, Park, just pause there for a second. Paul says, when you do church, when you gather, you're hurting more people than you're helping. That's how bad your church is. People show up and they're worse off by the time that they leave than when they first walked in. That's your church. Okay? That's, that's just not what you probably want to hear, right? They do more harm than good. He goes on to say this, in the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there's divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No, but no doubt there have been differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come together, watch this. It's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Now we're shifting. We're talking about communion. What we just did a few minutes ago in our service. He says, it's not the Lord's Supper. For, for, for when you're eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. Whew. Okay, so in case you missed it in the text, let me, let me, just so we all see clearly what's happening, this church was so divided, they weren't just divided over who their favorite teachers were, they were divided over the blood and body of Jesus Christ. You think about how, how crazy that is. The, the cross of Jesus Christ is the unifying factor. It is literally the banner that we come under so that it doesn't matter how much money you have, you don't have. It doesn't matter uh, you're red and yellow, black and white, wherever you come from, male, female, none of that matters now that we come under the banner of the cross. The cross unifies the church. It's what draws us all in together and this church specifically was dividing around the cross. And in, 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 very specifically, in two different camps. The rich and the poor. The rich were taking communion with the rich, and the poor were taking communion with the poor. And, and even, like, the, 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 the food and the wine, it wasn't being distributed equally, so the rich would end up with a lot more than the poor. So much so that the rich were getting drunk off of communion wine. Think about how messed up that is. And at the same time, they're getting drunk, the poor have nothing to eat and drink. How awful is this church? Like, honestly, like, they're just the worst. I, I, I said this in the nine, but like, the reality is, I was thinking about it. If I was the Apostle Paul, I don't think I would have even written them a letter. Like, or if I did, it would have been a very small letter. You tried, you failed, pack it in. You know, like, listen, you're, you just call it quits. You know, like, that's, when I read this, it's so bad what's happening that in my flesh, I don't always think like Jesus. Anyone ever been there? <laughs> okay, all right. There, I'm not alone. Thank God that God is more gracious than us. <laughs> Through his spirit, he inspires Paul to write these letters to a just broken church. 
broken on every front. And, and, and God is saying, all right, I'm not done with you yet. Church in Corinth, I'm not giving up on you yet. Yeah, you deserve for me to give up on you, but God's like, I'm not going to. You see, what, what God does is God, he doesn't just address the issues in our lives or the issues um, sometimes in our churches. Uh, rather, what he does is he goes on to give us the solutions to actually figure out how to fix it. God is gracious. God is love. This is amazing. And so uh, what, what I want to do now is, is, is I want to show you, we're, we're going to switch gears. So we looked at chapter three, they're dividing over their pastors. You look at chapter 11, they're dividing over communion. And again, I'm giving you snapshots, like every chapter almost has its own dysfunction. But then you, you, you go into chapter 13. This is our third text. This text is one of, chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians is one of the most popular Bible passages, like, in the book, okay? Uh, it's, it's super popular, and unfortunately, most times that we hear this, we hear it at weddings. Now listen, I'm not against using this at a wedding. I've used this at weddings that I've done, um, but it's not the primary context. The context of 1 Corinthians 13 has nothing to do with a couple being united in marriage, and it has everything to do with a divided, loveless church. You with me? All right, so let's look at this text, very popular right here. Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that I can move mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all that I possess to the poor and give my body over to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. This is wild here. What, see, what, what, what Paul does is he gives them like the metric for spiritual adulthood. And he says, like, like how you know whether or not you've, you've gotten out of the kiddie pool and you've actually grown up is by how well you love. Nothing else. He says, listen to me. He says, you can speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but if you don't have love, nothing. He says, you can have faith to move mountains, but if you exercise that faith in a loveless way, nothing. He says, you can even give everything that you have to the poor, sell your home, sell your car, give it all away to the poor. And he says, if you do that, Without love, it's nothing. Love is the metric to know whether or not you've entered into spiritual adulthood or not. A love that chapter 13 is sandwiched between 12 and 14. 12 and 14, if you don't know, are the spiritual gifts. It's good stuff. Can I tell you? It's, it's like the bread of the sandwich. It's not the meat. The meat is chapter 13. The meat is love. You see, like, sometimes in more like charismatic circles, I, I, I think sometimes we get this reversed and we, and we think, well, well, I speak in tongues. It's like, okay, good for you. That's not the main metric. It's like, well, I prophesy. Okay, good. Not the main metric. Do you love? Do you love well? That's the question. And Paul says, if you don't, if you're not loving well, but you're doing all of these other things, like I don't care how much money you give to the church. I don't care how much you're serving the church. Like if you're doing those things in a loveless way, you're missing the point. And this is what's so wild about following Jesus. God is not just after our right action. He's after the right heart behind the right action. Motives matter. Motives matter in God's kingdom. In fact, so much so that Paul will say in chapter three of this letter, he says, church in Corinth, listen, one day you're all gonna die. You're gonna be standing before Jesus in every good work that you've done that was not done with love. It's gonna be burned up right in front of you. And then he says this really 
haunting thing. He says, yeah, and he says, you're going to make it into heaven narrowly escaping hell. Motives matter. It's not just what we do, but why we do and how we do what we do that matters. Paul says love, it's the metric to know whether or not you're playing in a kiddie pool or you're swimming in the deep end. It is the metric. And then he goes on to say this. And this next text is, like, this is the one. It's arguably one of the most popular texts in the Bible. And as we read this, because we, we've all heard it before, most of us have all heard it several times, don't read it this morning in one ear, out the other. Sit under the weight of these words. Evaluate yourself. Let's see how we're, how we're doing 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, Paul defines what love is. He says, love is patient. Love is kind. Just pause. How you doing this morning? <laughs> I heard this pastor uh, <laughs> a while back. He was talking about when he drives his car. He said, he said, all the fruits of the Spirit fall off his tree. <laughs> Love is patient. Love is kind. Does not envy, does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. You know, I used to read this passage of scripture, and I used to think that Paul was simply rifling off like random things that was kind of popping into his mind at that, uh, at that moment. I don't think that at all anymore. I think right here, Paul is choosing his words very carefully, very carefully. Because what I believe he's doing here, and it's important that we see this, is I believe what Paul, he's, he's painting a portrait of Jesus himself. See, the Bible says that God is love. God is love. It also says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is God in flesh. Jesus is love in flesh. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus doesn't envy or boast. Jesus is, is, is not easily angered. Jesus keeps no record of wrongs. Anybody happy about that? Like, like Jesus, his love is the only love that will truly never fail. And what Paul does for the church, he's, he's saying, guys, you have to grow up. You have to get your eyes off of yourself. You have to get out of the kiddie pool and you got to cast your eyes upon Jesus Christ. Because the more that you look at the love of our God and experience the love of our God, that is the only time that you will naturally exude the love of God. Because if we're not careful this morning, we can turn all of this into, I need to try better. No, you don't. Well, maybe you do, but no. Listen, what you need to do is you need to spend more time with Jesus, the God of love. Because that is the only way that you will actually naturally become a more loving person. You need to stand on up all across this room. This is a really weird illustration, but I'm gonna to try to use it. My grandfather was born in Scotland. Uh, I have Scottish blood running through my veins. And simply what that means is that I'm a very white dude. I just am. Um, this right now is the most tanned that Danny Gray will ever be. I do not get darker than this. Uh, my wife does, I don't. Like I have a certain level, I'm Scottish. We Scots, we just, we, we can't, we, we hit a point, right? And it's like the end of summer, right? I, I, we have a pool, I was outside with my kids, I take them to the park. Why am, am I at my most tanned right now? Because I've spent a lot of time in the sun. You see me in January or February, I'm gonna look very different. 
okay? I'm like a ghost. I just go like full on white. Why? Because the sun's not out as long. I'm not out walking my kids as much in the winter. I'm not spending time in the sun. See, it's a, it's a pretty simple thing, right? Let me educate you on how to get a tan. Okay, ready? You spend more time in the sun, it changes your complexion. It literally changes your skin. Like there's a, it's like a quantifiable thing that you can see. The more time you spend in the sun, it changes you. Likewise, the more time you spend out of the sun, it changes you. So it is with Jesus. If you're here this morning and you're struggling with love, I need to tell you what you need right now. You don't need another self-help book. What you need right now is to spend more time with Jesus the Son. You need to spend more time in his presence. You need to spend more time on your knees praying to him. You need to spend more time asking him to pour out his spirit on you because it's then and it's only then that you will naturally actually shine out the son's love. Are, are you with me? Like this is a really weird way of saying it, but like the more time you spend with, you get like a Jesus suntan on your soul. And the less time you spend with him, it fades. You want to know how to love. You want to know how to be a church of love. We need to get back to the fundamentals of being with Jesus, the God of love. So I just want to ask the question as we close. How's your love? How's your love? Are you growing deeper in your love for God? Are you growing deeper in your love for your neighbors? Are you growing deeper in your love for this church? Here's an interesting one. Are you growing deeper in your love for your enemies? You're like, oh, pastor, don't ask me that. <laughs> How's your love? Now to be clear, I'm not asking you to like evaluate the last 24 hours of your life, okay? We all have bad days. What I'm asking is this, when you look back over the moment that you gave your life to Jesus until now, you look over that period of time, it's are you more loving than you once were? You see, love is a progressive work that God does in us bit by bit, piece by piece, uh, piece day by day, okay? It, it's, 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 it's progressive, right? It's something that God is continuing to do in us, right? Like I, every Christian, should be able to look through the rear view mirror of your life and say two things. Number one, I'm not where I should be. Some days I'm a mess. But number two, by the grace of God, I'm not where I once was. He's changing me. And listen, if that's your story, then I think we should just celebrate that. I think we should celebrate that, yeah, we're not perfect. We're not where we should be, but we're not where we were. Praise God that he hasn't given up on us yet. Praise God that when we act like the church in Corinth, he doesn't say, I'm done, I'm not writing to you, I'm not speaking to you anymore. Praise God that he graciously, lovingly walks with us and says, would you just come to me? Would you just come to me? Would you just look upon me? Would you just bask in my love? So much so that you're going to get a suntan, a God suntan that is not going to easily fade. Come on, how many people just want more of the love of God this morning? Like, I don't know about you, but some days, man, this is me. Some, some days, this is me. I'm a child. This is by the Apostle Paul, actually. He goes on right from this. You read the rest of chapter 13. He says, when I was a child, he said, I thought like a child, I acted like a child. He said, when I was a child, I got in the kiddie pool. But then I grew up. And when I became a man, he said, I, I put childish things away. He said, I, I gave up on the divisions. I gave up on all of the, the, the quarreling and the jealousy and the fits of rage. He says, I, I gave up on that. He says, I'm, I'm giving up on the kiddie pool. I think for some of us today, you need to give up on the kiddie pool, okay? It's weird. It's weird. Adults weren't made to play in kiddie pools. It's weird. 
And it's not just weird in here, it's weird to the world. There is an outside world watching. You ever wonder why Jesus says the main way that they will know that we are followers of Jesus is by how well we love one another? It's because when we don't love each other well, it might be the greatest thing to turn somebody off. This is why churches die with divisions but we rally stronger than, un, than ever under the love of Jesus Christ.